are recording this. We have had a few people who have indicated to us that they would really love uh, to uh, get a recording of this event that um, they, uh, they're they not able to make it this evening. And for me, it was important for people to, to get to have the benefit of uh, this presentation as well as the benefit of your excellent uh, questions. Um, so, uh, and then throughout the course of the next hour, um, my team is gonna take quick uh, pictures that's gonna make everybody look like G GQ models. So just want to make sure that you do that. Okay, so I'm gonna start off with a land acknowledgement uh, for Toronto. And even though we are meeting uh, virtually, we acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, and the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, with the Mississaugas of the credit. So with that, I wanna warmly welcome everyone uh, to my uh, 2021 federal budget uh, debrief. Um, I have already told you about the, the recording of photos. We've done the land recognition. I'm gonna go through a bit of a presentation. I will warn you the actual budget, uh, and I know all of you have read it, um, <clears throat> it is 724 pages. Uh, and for those who, who are, are not speaking, i.e. everybody else, Joe Pinto, if you could please mute, mute yourself, that would be really great. <laughs> that would be great. I'm sure everybody else will appreciate that. I'll do that right away. Thank you. And then um, uh, Alex or someone, one of my amazing team members is going to be putting into a link into the, uh, um, into the chat in terms of the actual budget, in case you want to open up on one of your screens. And in case you want to do any searches on it uh, uh, in the event that you have specific questions. So I think with that, um, I I'm going to go to the, uh, the, next, uh, the next slide. All righty. So, uh, oh, and this is what I meant to say. Sorry, I, I was distracted by Joe. Um, so while it's 724 pages, I'm not giving you a full summary of everything that's in uh, 724 pages. It's literally impossible for me to, to do so. Um, so I, um, I, uh, I'm going to sort of go through probably about 10 or 12 slides fairly quickly, because what I'd like to really spend the vast majority of my time is uh, to actually answer your questions. Um, there's three key sections to our budget. One is conquering COVID. As much as we'd like to believe that we're past COVID, we're not. We're still in a very difficult uh, third wave, uh, and we still have a way uh, before we, we get past the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Then there's a, a, a huge section of uh, federal budget 2021 that is on punching our way out of the COVID recession. So there's been a number of sectors uh, and small businesses that have been disproportionately impacted. Um, how is it that um, the federal government is, is supporting uh, those out of the recession? Um, and then the last section is build a better, fairer, more prosperous and innovative future. And I'm hoping to spend most of my time uh, on that. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so conquering COVID. Uh, so the, the Minister of uh, Finance, our, our Deputy Prime Minister, uh, has announced that um, we, can, we will continue to extend the wage subsidy and the rent subsidy until September 25th. We're also going to extend the Canada Recovery Benefit, which is uh, for another 12 weeks. Uh, but as of July 17th, we're moving the uh, Canada Recovery Benefit to $300 a week. So I want to make sure people know that. We're anticipating, we're, and we're hoping, that our economy will be coming back fairly quickly and that people will have a chance to, to be able to, to lock into some jobs. Um, we're going to sort of make sure that our EI rules are very flexible for an extra year because we know that it's not going to be easy for everybody to find a job um, or get back into the workforce. Um, we're spending a colossal amount of money on, on focusing on bringing in as many vaccines as possible. Uh, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, Canada is third in the G7 and G20 after the UK and the US in terms of bringing in vaccines. 24% as of today uh, have, of Canadians have been vaccinated with one dose. We're expecting about 50 million by the end of uh, June and 110 million by the end of September. So everybody that completely wants to be uh, vaccinated, that's double doses can be done by September. Um, 
And we actually believe that many of them will act, could actually be done by July 1st. Um, building domestic capacity, we spent a colossal amount of money. So when the pandemic started last year, uh, we uh, did not have any ability to produce any vaccines. And so we quickly uh, started engaging our manufacturing uh, sector to say, how is it that we can actually build that capacity? So in a year and a half, we have uh, started building that, that capacity. And by the end of this year, we'll be able to make our own vaccines and our own boosters. And already the minister is working on a game plan on 2022-2023 uh, uh, in case uh, we need continued, like the flu shot, you know, you're supposed to take the flu shot a year, so kind of to do that. She's actually going to provide a very big update to uh, all Canadians uh, this Friday, so stay tuned for more information on that. So the, the basic message of this whole section is we will be there for as long, we being the federal government, will be there for as long as it takes to keep Canadians safe, healthy, and supported. Next slide, please, Alex. Perfect. I'm punching out of our session. So um, uh, essentially, I think everybody knows this. All you have to do is walk along the main streets. Um, you know, people like Enzo, who I saw just join us, who's uh, head of the uh, Fairbank Village BIA. Uh, many of our BIA leaders and many of our small business owners will say that small and medium sized businesses have been disproportionately impacted. So we have quite a bit of money in to actually provide grants to small, like even like mom and pop shops um, to, uh, um, to do a digital adoption program. So basically to adopt new technologies, uh, to help hire back laid off workers, um, to actually invest in their own businesses. So it could be, I don't know, you need to sort of set yourselves up to, uh, you know, have better, I don't know, cleaning supply stations. So then we have a, a three-year program to actually finance small businesses so that they can uh, bring their businesses up to date and set themselves up to be competitive. And the other thing is, is that we've heard a lot of businesses complain about the credit card fees. And so um, we uh, are lowering the credit card swipe fees. So that's been a big ask of many people. Next, Alex. Alex, can I just do the slide myself? Do I just click on it? No, okay, you have to do. Okay, support for hardest hit industries. I know that as uh, I, we were admitting people in, I saw a number of people from our uh, arts uh, and uh, cultural uh, sectors. Um, we are providing over a billion more dollars to those within the arts and culture sector uh, to help sort of come out of this pandemic. Uh, so there's a big recovery fund and then really starting to fund a lot of the events and celebrations, live music that we're hoping to sort of come back with a vengeance uh, in the summer sort of fall time frame. Lots of money for tourism festivals events, huge emphasis as you can imagine on um, uh, huge, uh, you know, huge emphasis on uh, going across Canada or staying in Canada and sort of ba basically supporting the Canadian economy. Lots of money for the airports and airline sector. And then we need to sort of help uh, our charities and nonprofits who've really taken a hit and not been able to operate as well as raise money. So not only are we giving them a recovery fund of 400 million, but we're also launching consultations to say, how do we actually set it up from a tax perspective uh, so that our nonprofits and charities can be even more successful moving forward. Next, please, Alex. Uh, so building back better. So we're going to getting into that third section, which is where I want to spend most of my time. Where are we spending most of the $100 billion that we're planning on spending over the next uh, three years? Um, national child care. So uh, we have, we've wanted, I think Canadians have wanted to do this for 30 years, has been asking for it. Uh, and so the Liberal government has finally stepped, stepped up in a significant way to put this into our budget. So our goal is that five years from now, uh, all Canadian parents uh, will have access to high quality early learning childcare for an average of $10 per day. We're hoping to reduce the fees by about 50% by 2022. The total investments can be $30 billion over five years, and then we expect the ongoing funding will be around $8 billion. And the current plan is to do a 50-50 cost share um, with, um, the, um, with, the, uh, with the provinces, but, um, but we still have to negotiate that with them. 
so this is a signature piece. Um, I would say to you, uh, our, our uh, Deputy Prime Minister, Minister of Finance talks about this a lot. She says business leaders from across the country were asking for this. Uh, she said um, literally there was almost universal unanimity on the fact that this investment needed to be made. If we want to ensure full participation in our workforce, uh, we, and if we want to make sure that um, women have an equal chance to participate in our economy and that our kids have the best start moving forward, this is the best investment we can make. Next. Climate action and green economy. I saw a number of my, I call them my green friends, my green Davenport friends and advocates who've been pushing us to do better for five years. And I just wanna say that all your voices have been heard I, you can't imagine how proud I am, not only of the report that we put out in December that laid out a very, very clear plan uh, on how we're going to reach our uh, net zero targets and how we're, uh, you know, what our game plan is between now and 2030, how we're moving to a low carbon economy. And I will say to you, Mark Carney sort of gave a speech a couple of weeks ago and he said Canada's the first country in the G7 with a climate policy serious enough to make a difference. And so I just wanna say that we're, we're getting great uh, platitudes around the world for a very clear climate plan. And I will tell you, it is very much due to many of the Davenport residents that have been putting, pushing for a clear plan um, for the last few years. And I have absolutely echoed that and uh, delighted with not only our plan that we put on December, but also these additional almost $18 billion in new investments toward a green reco uh, uh, recovery. The stuff that's probably, uh, I think all of this is meaningful for any environmentalist, but I think the stuff that many people will, um, um, you know, hits a little bit closer to home is there's going to be quite a bit of money for home green retrofits, and that's going to begin this summer. There is a huge amount of money to make sure that we are conserving 25% of our land and our oceans by 2025. Um, we're putting a lot of money in for national infrastructure. So uh, for those who like bike riding, uh, there's a huge um, a ravine strategy in Toronto that is going to be funded by this natural uh, infrastructure fund. And then there's a huge net zero accelerator. So we need to, as everybody knows, we have to transition away from those sectors that actually emit uh, carbon uh, to uh, uh, that uh, emit large carbon emissions to those that uh, massively reduce it. So huge investment in green technology and green tech. Next, please. Uh, support for workers. So we are uh, determined. Our unemployment rate is about 7.6%. Um, it's uh, nowhere near as bad as it was a year ago, uh, but it's fragile. So we know we want people, we want Canadians to uh, have a chance to find better jobs, uh, to retrain, uh, to get back into uh, the workforce. Uh, we are committed to creating a million new jobs by the end of this year. Um, we're, and then we're doing a few other things. We're increasing the Canada workers benefit. So these are, this is a benefit that helps people on the absolute lowest end of the income scale. So they're earning more or less minimum wage. We're basically topping up their, their income uh, for, it's, it's for 1 million Canadians um, and it's gonna lift over 100,000 Canadians out of poverty. We're increasing the federal minimum wage, a huge ask for many Davenports to $15 an hour. I'm very proud we're doing it. And we're extending the EI sickness benefit from 15 to 26 weeks. Uh, there should be nobody who it has some sort of a serious illness and has to worry about whether or not they can put food on the table while trying to come out of their, their illness or try to heal from their illness. So these are sort of, again, just to let everybody know, there's more supports in there. I'm just pulling out the big ones, particularly the ones that I've heard Davenport residents talk uh, ask me for uh, over the last uh, weeks, months, uh, years. Next, please. Uh, support for seniors. Um, uh, I would say that there's been a lot of uh, people, a lot of Canadians that have been screaming at the top of their lungs way before COVID started about um, our long-term care homes. Um, and uh, I don't think many people were listening. And I think it was an awful, awful reality for us to have to go through COVID and see how many of them uh, passed away and to recognize we didn't have long-term care standards and we weren't taking care of the people that helped us uh, build our economy. So we are spending $3 billion. Uh, just so everybody is reminded, long-term care homes is the uh, purview of the provincial governments. It is, it is them, it is their power, um, and uh, it's in their power, but we are uh, committed to national long-term care standards. So this is not only to create the standards, but ensure that they are enforced across the country. 
Uh, so I want to make sure that people know that. Uh, and then, you know, we need to continue to support our seniors. Um, we've been uh, trying to uh, support our seniors for the last five years. We uh, decreased the, the uh, age of retirement from 67 to 65. That helped a lot of seniors. We increased the guaranteed income supplement. That helped a lot of seniors. And now we're also planning on increasing by 10% the um, old age security payments for those that are over 75 uh, starting next year. And then in the meantime, we're gonna be providing a one-time $500 payment. We know as you get older, your costs are more expensive. You have more healthcare needs. And so we want to be able to provide for that. Keep on going, next one, please. Oh, youth. Um, we're determined to make sure that youth, uh, so my nephew's in university right now, and um, you know, he feels a little bit ripped off. Like he kind of feels like, you know, I don't have the experience of university. I don't feel I'm learning as well. I don't feel I have access to as many opportunities. And so we're determined as a national government to make sure that youth are not, are not a lost generation. So we are spending a colossal amount of money and a lot of creativity to make sure that post-secondary education, both uh, the cost that you've already incurred. Uh, so if you're already finishing up, we want to make sure that you're able to pay off uh, your debts much quicker and get a head start on your career. Uh, but also for those that are going through university, that it's much more affordable and accessible and easy for you to do so. And we're spending almost a billion dollars to make sure that you that students that are coming out or looking for work, they've got apprenticeships, internships, placements. And I do want to give a shout out in Davenport. We received one point nine million dollars uh, this year. We just learned uh, uh, I believe it was Friday last week that we had $1.9 million and that's going to produce a lot of jobs locally uh, at our nonprofits, at our small businesses, across the riding uh, for our youth uh, in our community. And, um, and so we're, we're determined to, to, to keep on supporting our youth and that they will not uh, feel the, uh, you know, not be a step behind because uh, they had to endure this, uh, this pandemic. Next. Indigenous. Um, there is a Davenport residents feel a, a very strong sense of fairness and that we have to right the wrongs of the past. And uh, Jane Jacobs, uh, I'm a big Jane Jacobs fan for those who know her. Uh, she used to say that the way to sort of deal with uh, mistakes or uh, the pain of the past is to give gifts in the future. And so we have spent, we as a federal government has have been very, very serious about um, uh, reconciliation with our First Nations and narrowing the gaps between the Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. And so a lot more money is in here, continue to eliminate the long-term well water advisory, build water infrastructure, a lot more money around mental health supports, around Indigenous governance, entrepreneurship, um, uh, and lots of other items. It really is about continuing on the track of, of reconciliation. And then I wanted to pull this out, 2.2 billion to accelerate the work which is basically to implement all the recommendations of the national inquiry into the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. Uh, it is an awful travesty that um, our indigenous uh, women and girls uh, are uh, subjected to more violence uh, and more murder um, than uh, the average uh, Canadian um, and well, the average Canadian woman, by the way. Uh, and, um, and so we have to stop that. And this is serious money to tackle this as quickly as possible. Next. Okay, building back better on infrastructure. Um, so again, uh, there's lots of things I could have pulled out, but I'm just going to mention two or three key things that I think uh, you'll want to know about. Uh, we announced a historic amount of $14 billion. This was actually in February, but we put it in our budget um, for public funding and public transit across Canada. $3 billion is, is permanent. If we really want to get to a low carbon economy, public transit absolutely has to be part of it. We're going to continue to invest in uh, universal broadband uh, we realize more than ever during this pandemic how much we are reliant, and it is a right, uh, not a um, not a sort of nice to have to have a high speed internet uh, in all of our urban as well as rural remote areas. Um, the um, the community revitalization uh, fund. Uh, there's going to be a lot of local infrastructure projects uh, to revitalize our main streets and farmers markets. So all of those who are part of the BIAs, uh, stay tuned. Uh, for some more good news around that, just because it'll help us to, to, to invest in what we need to actually uh, spark, uh, you know, a restart of our local lo local business economies. Uh, Natural Infrastructure Fund, I think I already talked about that in terms of the Toronto Ravine strategy, bike infrastructure, active transportation walking paths, all of those who are, you know, part of any park groups, if you think we need more walking paths, 
the, this is uh, the fund for that. And then I also want to mention, this would be a miracle. I can't wait for the day when this actually is completed, but we've been talking about a high frequency rail in the Toronto Quebec city corridor for so long, man, finally we have the money committed towards it. And I really can't wait till we actually sort of not only start it, but get it done next. Housing affordability. The vast majority of the dollars uh, in the budget is really about how to create more affordable housing units, so at, more rental units, and how do we commit enough money to eliminate chronic homelessness? Uh, three years ago, we introduced a budget that said we're gonna eliminate homelessness in Canada in 10 years. Last year, we decided, no, not acceptable. We have to eliminate it immediately. So that is what our target is, eliminate homelessness, uh, build a lot more affordable rental and build up a lot more uh, affordable uh, housing spaces in general. Next. A more equal Canada. So this probably takes up about like 200 pages in terms of all the things we're trying to do to create a more just society. So um, we are serious about tackling sy uh, systemic racism. Uh, so we've, we've really focused on, on our black community. Uh, this is, they specifically asked for this in Davenport. I did a black um, Davenport Canadian round table. And I would say that this is among the top of their asks was for uh, a body uh, to be funded that would be so it's kind of like an endowment that would be funded so that um, black uh, community groups could be uh, could help build their own capacities uh, to fund black entrepreneurship uh, to uh, uh, fund black advocacy um, all of that all the ways that we can eliminate and tackle systemic racism um, i want to also mention uh, to everyone that there's quite a bit of money in order to uh, tackle sexual misconduct, misconduct and gender-based violent, violence in our military. Um, I'm, I'm very, very passionate about uh, immigrants and uh, our immigration system. We have a significant amount of money actually to um, update our immigration system. This means a lot because if we are going to bring in, if we're going to have a successful future economy, we want to make sure that we have a modern uh, 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 immigration system that makes it easy for uh, new Canadians with the with the skills and the talent and the energy and ideas that we need to be able to, to sort of come to Canada. Um, new disability benefit, we still have to take uh, consultations. We're spending more, 100 million more for accessible workplaces. This is an area, in my opinion, we have to do a lot more work on, um, but we could talk more about it later. There's some money for LBGTQ2 groups. There's some money for veterans, a lot of dedicated funding for housing, mental health and supports for family and uh, also the opioid crisis. This is a huge, huge epidemic as well. Uh, and so I will say to you that uh, we'll put significant amount of money for harm reduction prevention uh, at the community level. Next, please. I have one more slide on this, which is um, putting where we continue to be committed to uh, investing in, um, in tackling gun violence and getting guns off of our streets. So that's uh, a significant amount of money uh, huge in terms of, and I want to mention the next two bullet points are the same. There's a lot of gender-based violence. There's a lot of violence against women in our country. As a female politician, I definitely am on the opposite end of that. And so I do want to say that we have not only committed about $300 million to tackling uh, gender-based violence, as well as ensuring that we support our feminist organizations to come up with the policy that we need to be able to tackle the root causes but we've, in addition, invested in this budget $600 million more dollars on a new national action plan to end gender-based uh, violence. And then we have a lot of legal supports for vulnerable communities. Uh, we have a great uh, organization, the West uh, Toronto uh, Legal uh, Services, um, and they do a lot of work with immigrants uh, and racialized communities as well as refugees, and they often ask for funding. And I know that uh, this is a, a significant investment that we've made in, our, in this budget. Next, please. I think we're into the last one or two slides. Alex, thank you. Oh, tax fairness. Let me tell you, one of the top uh, uh, topics that Davenport residents write to me on, it is everybody needs to um, pay, the, pay their fair share of taxes. Nick, uh, high frequency rail is just fast train. <laughs> so you have a fast train. It doesn't take you like five hours to get from Toronto to Quebec City or seven hours. I think it's seven hours. It, you would sort of get, get there in like two and a half hours and it becomes much more efficient. Okay, for tax fairness, um, 
essentially, this is just our way to continue to ensure that everybody pays their fair share of taxes. So we're in we're imposing a bit of a wealth tax. So it's a luxury tax on cars and aircrafts, as well as uh, pleasure boats. We are taxing our digital dot giants, and we are determined to actually start taxing them this summer. And we think we can do that. We continue. So we've already invested over a billion dollars to combat tax evasion and tax avoidance, uh, but we are committing another three hundred million dollars. And then we're starting to tax vacant property owned by non-resident foreign nationals, um, as well as working with uh, President Biden and the, the other OECD countries to make sure that we all have. Uh, come together with one corporate tax rate so that companies don't go to the lowest tax rate jurisdiction in the world, but we have one uh, low uh, uh, tax rate that uh, remains of all, all OECD countries. So that is being worked on. Next. Our fiscal plan, responsible and targeted spending. So, you know, I think, I, you know, I'm happy to answer questions on this. I think that our debt to GDP ratio for those who are finance uh, aff affectionados out there, uh, we went from around 30% uh, before the pandemic started to about 40, uh, 49 or 50% right now. Um, OECD came to our finance committee last week and they said, we're doing very well in terms of managing our debt. And that if we did not spend the amount of money that we had spent, uh, we would be in far worse economic shape right now. So uh, we're, we're managing our, our debt to GDP ratio. We're managing our deficit situation. Our way to actually reduce the deficit, pay down our debt is actually to grow our economy, which is a core part of what our huge investments, whether it's childcare, whether it's investing in the green economy, whether it's investing in infrastructure, uh, whether it's uh, investing in a whole number of of things is all about growing our economy so that we could actually get back to a balanced budget and to manageable debt, debt levels. And I think that's about it. Is there a, 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 one last slide? Yes, we will do whatever it takes as long as it takes to keep Canadians safe, healthy, and supported. Alrighty, so I think with that, um, Jesse is going to be um, is going to be great in terms of, and um, Alex, if it's okay with you, oh no, you, it's okay. This was the last slide, but it wasn't anything. It was just if a question came up, Alex. I don't need to sort of run through this. But would you mind if you just go back to uh, just uh, the full the full view where I see um, everybody's hands and faces? Uh, so we'll get off of this presentation, and uh, and then we Jesse will tell me who's our first questioner. So uh, I would like to get as many questions as possible, and uh, so if you could please limit it to question um, and. Um, I know, I know there's probably, it's funny, you could spend a hundred billion dollars and people can still ask you, <laughs> well, you forgot something. So uh, if there's something good that you think that's in the budget, please also identify it while you're also sort of identify what you might think we might have missed. <laughs> Anyways, uh, okay, so Jesse, who's our first uh, person on our list? I'm just going to also mention that if you have a, a question that you'd like to ask verbally, please use the raise hand function on Zoom and then I can keep a list of, of who's up next. Um, the first person, he's had his hand up since he entered, so I think we'll give it to Rory and then I'll just put together some of the ones we've had in the chat so far. Well, no, it's a little unfair though, Rory. You kind of know like how to get advanced <laughs> into the first step, but that's okay. We give you, we give you credit for being, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, excited to ask a question. Oh. Um, what I wanted to ask about is we have 14.3 billion earmarked for public transit works. If you read the larger form document outside of your slideshow, that's over eight years. So that's around 1.8 billion per fiscal year. Uh, we're giving like 6 billion to Air Canada in a bailout and we're spending one point. Eight billion every year on other public transit works. That doesn't really make great sense to me. That's my only comment. Hmm. Okay. Well, I appreciate your comment, Rory. And I'd have to uh, get one of my team members to sort of uh, remind me. And it might not be this moment. It might be as we go along while they have time to sort of uh, take a quick peek at um, at sort of the numbers. I believe that most of the money that we're actually giving to Air Canada is loans that they have to pay back. Yeah, they have to pay back four of the six. Of the six. And then of the other two, I think, 
uh, and again, I, I have to, I don't have the actual data in front of me, but I get your point. You're basically saying, why are we bailing out sort of our airlines more from a one year perspective than we are in public transit? I will say to you, we've probably, we've given a colossal amount of money to public transit over the last five years. The 14 billion is a historic amount that we announced in February. Uh, it is over a, a, a period of time, but know that it's gonna be matched up with provincial dollars also know, Rory, that it is, if you look at the history, even over the last 10 years, too little of our federal governments have actually invested enough in public transit. So we really stepped up to the mark and I hope we set a standard for future federal governments to continue to invest in such a colossal way. I think for the airline industry, I think people, uh, Canadians love to travel, we're a big country. Uh, we wanna have a healthy um, airline. Um, and I, I think that uh, I will tell you for as many letters in Davenport that I received of people who says we want airlines to repay our, uh, to refund our package, our, our, our travel that had to be canceled due to COVID. I would say as, as many people wrote to me and said, please save our airlines. Uh, they are jobs. They are fueling an economy and they're fueling uh, travel. But anyways, I appreciate your point. Thank you. I, I wrote you and didn't say save them. I said nationalize them. Anyways. Uh, well, I appreciate that. We definitely got a few uh, a few comments like that, but I appreciate you letting me know. Anyway, thanks for your question. Who's next? So next we had uh, Sarah Eden and Levi, and then followed by Liam Duncan. All righty, Eden, I'm always terrified of your question <laughs> of whether or not we're investing enough in our internationally. Uh, so, anyways, let me let, let you ask the question. <laughs> Well, my question was, how much are we giving to help vaccinate uh, other countries, like third world countries? That's a great question. I know we had given $2.2 million, Alex. I know you're, you kind of, you'll have to give me a, a nod of the head or not a nod of a head, and I can't even see anymore. But um, I, don't, I don't have a top of mind, but I know we've given a, a, a lot of money and we'll continue to do it. Hold on, let me see if I have it. Um, I have like the dollars we're spending for the Rohingya crisis and the migrant, the Venezuelan migrant and refugee in the Middle East strategy, and you know supporting the African Development Bank. Uh, but I do not have it on. Um, it's Covax, right? Do you have it, Alex? Uh, just to put some info in the the chat there from from the budget. Um, so uh, it it. Uh, recaps there the, the amount spent and then the new oh. new investment um, in the budget it's two billion ha! that's great I thought it was two million I was like gosh that's small but two billion is a significant amount of money um, I will say I will say to Eden like we're we are I know that we, we try to come up and, and step up strong so that I'm glad that it's that amount sorry what's your question do we have a plan for um, passing on our extra vaccines once we are um, once like well, the prime minister publicly committed to that when people thought that we were being a little bit overly anxious with signing agreements with seven different vaccine uh, countries, uh, sorry, companies, and four have been approved by Health Canada. And so we have 110 million doses coming in by the end of September. So he's already committed that our additional doses will be going to uh, third world countries. Mm -hmm. Sorry, to countries who can't afford it. They might not all be third world, by the way. They just might be having a hard time accessing it. So places like Brazil, by the way, is having a hard time accessing it because they did not sign contracts early enough. And they, and they also put all their bets into one vaccine option as opposed to multiple ones. And that's what Canada did, which is why we are third in the world right now in terms of getting vaccines. Way behind both the UK and the US, but still we're third and I'm, I'm very proud of how fast that we acted. Okay, thanks so much and nice to see you guys. Okay, next. Sorry, next was uh, Liam Duncan, if you'd like to un unmute yourself. Yep, just finding it. Uh, so I hope that this wasn't already covered in the slideshow. Uh, I saw the foreign ownership vacancy tax. Um, I, th I Obviously, that's a great thing. I think we, and we need as much help as we can get when people are being forced out of their home. Uh, with rising prices, uh, and people are using it as in speculative investments. I just wonder, uh, Vancouver, I think, if uh, correct me if I'm wrong, introduced a 3% vacancy tax flat. Toronto, only 1%. Uh, 
uh, I'm wondering uh, if if there's any plans to make that more aggressive, even than the Vancouver one, or at least ensure uh, that uh, that homes aren't being used for speculation as much as possible in population centers where we need as much density as we can get. And we need homes to be filled with people, whether they're renting or buying. Well, for, for, well, first, nice to see you, Liam. It's nice to see you looking well. Yeah. Um, so uh, we actually started that when we came into office, we decided we needed to have data as to how many foreign companies or co for, foreigners are actually buying up our property. So I know we now have five years worth of data. I should actually ask after that data. The answer to your question is I don't actually know what percent we're planning on taxing it, like the vacancy rate. Uh, and so we'll let you know as soon as we know. I know that that wasn't listed in the budget, but I know we made a grant proclamation that we are planning on doing that. Alex, do you have the number of how much we hope to earn from that? Is it like $722 million that we're hoping to earn over? I don't know if it's like a two-year time period or three-year time period. So if we have that, we must have some sort of an idea. So I, I don't know the answer, Liam, but once we get it, we'll make sure that you, you get it back. That's about putting it in the chat. I'm sorry, say that again. Uh, Alex? Sorry, I put it in the chat. Uh, what did you say? Let's see. This is the Se link to the 700 million over four years for, for yep. this uh, tax. Hmm. Pretty good yes. Memory. Yeah. I actually read 350 pages of the budget, so <laughs> glad I remembered it. Okay, who's next? Okay, so I'm just going to have uh, two quick questions that were in the chat box uh, earlier on. Is there's a question about the uh, $15 minimum wage and when we might expect to see that implemented and also what elements of the budget um, you feel might address your own bill that you've introduced on GBI? Good questions. Okay, so the first one, $15 minimum wage, uh, I think our intention is to, and Alex, please keep me honest, I'd like you to go right to the 50th, see if we have an indication of the budget of when we're hoping to implement. My, what I'm suspecting is that as soon as we pass the legislation and it receives royal assent, I, I, I think we hope to enact it right away. Um, we have about 900,000 federally, like uh, employees at, that are controlled uh, by, you know, sort of like crown corporations or federally employed and 47,000 of them are, uh, are below uh, minimum wage. And so uh, we would want to tackle that right away. So Alex, feel free to just say it like it, just so that people don't have. So what's the what's the answer? Is it as soon as legislation's passed or there's no information? Um, there's no specific timeline, uh, but uh, it it's, does seem like it's, you know, uh, as soon as the, the legislation comes through, it says it will directly benefit 26,000 workers who make less than. Uh, okay, less than what I said at 47. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Oh, and then uh, my uh, guaranteed basic income. Well, the truth is I don't, like I'm still digesting the whole worker section and trying to understand it, to be very honest. Um, if anything, budget 2021 has made me believe even more, more firmly in the absolute need for, uh, for a new foundation to our social welfare system and the fact that we should be testing implementation pilots of guaranteed basic income in Canada, which is what my favorite members bill. So I think what I would say to you is the fact that there's, it's largely silent and in many cases really it doesn't point that the federal government is at the moment thinking about adopting or um, wanting to sort of test out implementation models. I'm not discouraged. It just makes me want to fight even more and to explain more why it is that we need it more than ever before. Uh, so stay tuned uh, with everyone. Um, like stay tuned for those who are big supporters of it. Please uh, keep in touch with my office. I'm, uh, you know, I'll be uh, spending quite a bit of time talking about it in the coming months and trying to raise the, the national discussion conversation around it. Okay, next, uh, Jesse. Okay, so the next two, we have a phone number who's called in. I unfortunately can't see a number, uh, a name, but they've raised their hand for a question. And then after them was Delia A. Well, she looks like Grace, Grace Jones. So I really hope it is Grace Jones. <laughs> Although I'll take uh, Delia A. Um, okay. <laughs> Hello. 
Hi there. Well, now, just so you guys know, I think this will be the only pass I give. I, I really would like to see your name. It's uh, you see my name and everybody else has their name. So for those with phone numbers, do try to change it to name. Can you introduce yourself, please, Mr. Phone Number? Uh, Michael Rosenberg. Oh, hi, Michael Rosenberg. Hello. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like the use of debt for, for emergency situations like this makes total sense. But um, the economy isn't going to grow to the point where we can just absorb that. Um, it will likely have some negative effect in the future. Um, the economy should be expected to recover from to where it was, but not grow beyond that. Uh, you know, a lot of there are environmental limits, there are resource limits, and technology is unproductive in many cases. So we should not expect the economy to just keep growing. So I, I think we should not not just be saying, oh, the economy is going to grow out of this and then we won't have a problem. That That's misleading and it, it leads to sort of a bad approach to environmental and technological issues. It makes us think that, we, that we're still somehow going to keep expecting to see growth. I mean, it's been like 40 years since we had any significant economic growth. So it's a, don't, it's a totally different world now, and we are in a, an economically limited, resource-limited world. So just I think it's important that we create an expectation that there is such a thing as a maximum size to the economy, mm -hmm. and it can, it can shrink rather than grow when you overinvest. So let's not have create sort of false expectations that we don't have real economic limits in the world. Um, I hope that that can sort of be taken into consideration and we don't sort of just use the language of growth will continue. Mm -hmm. A lot of the economic numbers are overstated by about 2% per year, so we might think there's growth when it's actually a shrinking economy. Mm -hmm. And we should be aware that, that there are real factors that cause the economy to shrink and Mm -hmm. And and let's think about that. Think about problems due to technology being unproductive. Mm -hmm. Think about economic and, and environmental limits. When we talk about the economy, mm -hmm. I'd like to see the language be more reflective of that. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Michael, you're obviously uh, someone who has is very read up on it on on this and. I will say to you, one of the key questions I have asked our Minister of Finance, and uh, I think you'll all find this interesting, I did say to her, how do we grow the economy in a way that's sustainable? Because when we think about growth, you almost are like, well, let's unleash the power of, of you know, uh, stimulus spending. But the truth is, I don't want the economy to be growing any way, way near the way the way we have grown in the past so that's one two michael i think that the comment you've made is something it's literature that's actually existed for a long time people said we're moving into a world where growth levels will be nowhere near what it used to be and we have to adjust our expectations for that so i i take your comment and i take it seriously i would say to you my sense is and i think the bank of canada adjusted their numbers upwards today in terms of canada's growth numbers I think in the short term, um, there will be significant growth. And when I say short term, I'm talking about two, three, maybe even four years. But I think ongoing, my sense is that you're right to caution us and to uh, tell us that we need to be thoughtful about the world we're moving into. COVID is one uh, disruption. Climate change is, is another disruption. And there's lots of transitions going on. So uh, anyways, very wise words. And I, Michael, I, I say this genuinely, I really hope that in the coming weeks, like give me a few weeks, just because we're really overwhelmed right now in my office. Uh, but I would love to chat with you a little bit further on this. Um, we constantly have the governor of the Bank of Canada uh, come and see us. We have people from OECD come and see us. We have PBO come and see us. We have a lot of uh, economists from across the country and around the world come see us. And I would love to be able to ask them a few specific questions, but you can connect with me, uh, I would really be really grateful. But I, I hear you and I, I take your caution seriously. So thank you. Okay, next. Uh, oh, we've got Tom, um, not Grace Jones. <laughs> Hi there. Nice to meet you. What's your name? Is your name Dyla? It, it's Dela. Dela. Nice to meet you, Dela. Thanks for joining us today. 
Good to meet you, Julie. Uh, thank you for all those details. I was just wondering something that kind of, uh, you know, pointed out at me. You guys said that you're gonna extend uh, the CRB to like an additional 12 weeks, but you're lowering it to $300 a week? Starting July 7th, 17th, July 17th. So we don't have the vaccine until like the end of June and you have more funding going into like trying to make the vaccine here until the end of the year. And like the average, like, you know, to be able to survive in Toronto costs about maybe $1,900 and that doesn't include rent. So I'm just wondering how you expect people who are relying on these types of benefits to continue to live in the Davenport region, in your region. Cause like right now I could tell you half of my employment insurance goes to my rent. And you know, I'm like playing Russian roulette with my bills, you know, trying to pay them, you know, and you're saying that you're supporting the homeless community, the housing community, you wanna build more housing. But it's like, how are these people, you know, supposed to afford to even live in Toronto with, you know, minimum wage going up $15 an hour, that's roughly like $27,000 a year. So I'm just wondering where you're, where the Liberal Party came up with the uh, lowering of the CRB benefits. So thank you for that question. I think you probably speak on behalf of a lot of people who are kind of struggling to sort of say, well, how do I get back on track in terms of a job? You know, I'm not going to be vaccinated for a bit. So here's what I would say to you, Dela. Um, one, uh, listen to uh, Minister Anand. She's going to give an update on vaccines. I suspect we're going to have a lot more vaccines come in a lot earlier so that more people will have a chance to be vaccinated. I also think that a good chunk of our population, again, if everything goes well, could be actually vaccinated by the beginning of July. So stay tuned. Stay tuned, listen in to uh, Minister Anand uh, this Friday. The second thing I would say to you is our government has been nothing if not consistent. If there's been a glitch, if uh, the economy is taking longer to recover, we continue to extend those supports. We have done it consistently since last year um, and we, can, uh, we, we continue to do so. So if we're starting to see we need to sort of extend those benefits even longer, we will uh, based on uh, what we have seen in the past. I'll also say to you, there's a colossal amount of money that's about to be unleashed in terms of people helping people with funding for training, retraining, finding jobs, that kind of internships, that kind of stuff. If for some reason, and this goes to everyone on this call, uh, my office serves, uh, I think is a very good point uh, for people who might be looking for their next step to retrain, train, or find a job, or just connect to really great resources. And please feel free to sort of uh, make sure that you connect with me Again, wait another month or so. <laughs> We're a little overwhelmed right now. Uh, we'll have some extra people on hand within a month. Uh, but uh, Dale, stay in touch with me. Like, let's let's connect again in June, and let's see where you're at. Let's see whether you've been vaccinated, whether the economy really is starting to recover, whether we're coming out of this really painful third wave, um, and uh, let's have a chat then. Okay. Thank you. Who's next, Jesse? Okay, so next we have David Har uh, Hardy and, and then followed by Ala Kammer. Perfect. Two wonderful people in our cultural sector, cultural and artistic sector. Hi, David, nice to see you. Thanks, Julie. Thanks again for doing this. This is, a, this is really valuable. And I'd just like to comment on the previous question from Dale. I think that's a, such an important point to make that life in Toronto is becoming extremely, I mean, it's just getting, it's beyond reach for so many people. And, and that's, that's a fundamental issue that, that not just Toronto, but ma major cities across the country are going to have to contend with um, and, and frankly do a better job. And then that, that factors into public transit and all sorts of upgrades that can make life maybe just a little bit less expensive here. But my question is, um, first of all, I just wanted to thank you for the, the uh, the support that the budget gives to the Canadian Media Fund and Telefilm and, and other uh, institutions that help us keep the film and television industry alive in this country. Um, we could not do it without you, simply put. Um, and, and support for the performing arts. My partner is a classical musician and uh, the performing arts in big organizations like, like hers have been absolutely hammered um, and as have individual musicians. So it's going to really take some serious directed attention to have this country build its cultural industries back. 
Um, but my my just quite my quick question is about the five billion dollar accelerator fund, the green accelerator fund. Can you talk just a teeny bit more about that? It I, I sense that it's geared more towards the oil patch and repurposing oil exploration into hydrogen and other things, but uh, how accessible will that fund be to smaller um, startups and companies that are looking for um, for some kind of a, an injection to help get over the hurdle of getting a product to market? Uh, so David, thanks. first thanks, uh, thanks for acknowledging all the work that we're doing for artists and the supports that we're providing, it means a lot. I will tell you, I see a lot of uh, William White in my neck of the woods for uh, there's still a lot of TV production and film stuff that's going on. And I always I say a silent hello to you every time I see one of them, just to let you know. Um, uh, and um, I will tell you, in terms of uh, rebuilding the art sector, the, the opportunity is that we actually try to find a way to fix some of the structural changes. And I really would love to have a session with the, the those in the cultural uh, and artistic uh, sector within our writing in terms of some ideas about how do we actually spend the big pots of money that we have allocated. But in terms of your answer, in terms of the um, the uh, a net zero accelerator, it is exactly that. It really is to try to transition a lot of our big industries that were tra that traditionally huge emitters of huge emissions into sort of low carbon. So carbon capture, like a lot of the new green technologies and investments. I will say to you, I don't know the answer because even if I like frantically look to the sort of like section within the environmental, um, you know, the environmental section of the budget, I'm not quite sure if I can actually find that fund. I would make you a bet that there's probably some sort of a fund that would be available. So David, connect with us again. Um, Alex is usually the, the first person that sees the emails coming into my email. So he will know your name and he will know to sort of pull that uh, out to sort of make sure that we look for it. And I do have a couple of my staff members that are taking notes right now so that we could already try in advance to find um, to find that fund. Sorry, to find, um, uh, to sort of respond back to you and uh, with that, uh, with a more complete answer. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Alex Hammer. All right, uh, first of all, thanks for doing this. This is awesome. Uh, and thanks for all your work with the Canada Summer Jobs Investments. Um, I think it's tripled uh, since 2015, you said? And it's six times more. Six times, there you go. Uh, <laughs> it went from 300,000 to 1.9 million. <laughs> It's just fantastic. Uh, and thank you for advocating for arts and culture in Davenport. It's just so essential. Um, and uh, we wouldn't be anywhere without, without that support. Um, I, I just have one comment um, is that to, you know, and you know this, that, that arts is not all made at Stratford and Shaw and the COC. Um, and arts is made to, arts is made by artists and small companies and to to make sure that um to make sure that funding trickles down past the just the big institutions uh is vital so thank you for that and i just want to give a shout out to uh, monica and my team who's instrumental on the canada summer jobs file uh there's no way <laughs> i could do it without her uh and so she's uh I'll tell you for all of those that are out there, uh, us actually knowing your organizations means a lot to us. Uh, we make sure that we validate all the uh, amazing organizations uh, to Service Canada when, before they make their selections. So uh, I just really wanna just honor and appreciate Monica's work uh, on that. Um, in, you're right, just so you know the recovery fund, there's $300 million. It's actually, uh, and I was reading some of the fine print, there is, it's also meant for small and medium-sized organizations. And I know Theodore Gargantch was part of that. So um, I, I, I'm just gonna make a note over to Alex who, who kind of carries my arts and culture uh, file. We should organize ourselves into a session sometime before June so that we could provide a little bit more direction. One, give you guys specifics. If, as the funds open up, how do you actually apply? And then if there's some criteria we can influence, then you guys can sort of help us define what those are. Excellent. That would be so helpful. Thank you so much. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for joining us. Alrighty, who's next? Uh, I'm going to say there's a couple questions in the chat, all on the topic of looking for uh, pharmacare and not seeing it in the budget. So we'll give you that first, and then we'll move back to some of the other folks who have their hands raised. Okay, thank you. Um, look, one of, the, one of the things that I don't think we did well in our budget uh, was actually 
it, because PharmaCare isn't uh, put in as a, as a signature item, people think that we're not moving forward on PharmaCare. We are moving forward on PharmaCare. It was the signature piece of our 2019 budget. It's, you know, I have it in front of me, moving forward uh, on implementing national PharmaCare. Um, so we continue to be committed to it. Um, I will tell uh, those who might have asked the question, Minister of Health, uh, Patty Haiju is joining me uh, in virtual Davenport next, keep me honest team, I think next Wednesday night um, uh, for a session and we could directly ask her about the top three things on health that's, uh, that's uh, from the community is uh, mental health, uh, pharma care, and there's something else, but I'm forgetting it. I'm having a senior's moment. <laughs> Anyways, I want to tell people not only am I fully committed uh, to ensuring that we move as quickly as possible on PharmaCare, national, accessible, universal PharmaCare, but I know our government is. Um, and so, and I've, I, there's a letter of, uh, dated March 5th on my website, and I outlined the key steps that we've already taken that is moving us towards national PharmaCare. Um, our budget only indicates an additional, I think, $500 million for rare diseases. Uh, which is part of a national pharmacare program, uh, but all the money that we've already committed to the drug formulary, um, to the uh, Canadian Drug Agency, to a new national formulary on prescribed drugs um, is, uh, con continues to be there and it continues to be a priority for our government. And again, uh, feel free to uh, join us uh, next week where I can have the, uh, the Minister of, uh, of Health uh, you know, outline that herself. Oh. Pharmacare, healthcare, hold on. I know there's something else Monica's tell me. Oh no, vaccines, Matt and Monica, but there's one other thing that everybody wants to talk to me about. Uh, I'm forgetting it, but anyways, it'll come to me. Okay, uh, so thanks for that. Uh, Jesse, who's next? I see Joe trying to be patient, but I know he's after the owner's iPad, Sharon McPherson, right? Yes, so I'm only seeing the first part of the name uh, owner's iPad, but if you'd like to share your name when you have your question, you're up first. Uh, I already oh. know who it is. I can tell oh. like I can tell Sharon anytime behind any iPad. Hi, Sharon. How are you? Fine. <laughs> I missed you. I haven't seen you in a while. No. <laughs> have been I've, I've been around. Well, I'm glad. Well, I'm sending you a huge hug. Um, what's your question? I like to know why um, people over seventy five are getting the boost, but not people the seniors seventy five and under who could be in poverty, like people with disabilities, who are seniors are in poverty more than any other group, mm -hmm. and uh, mental disability goes up when you age. Why is it seventy five and not sixty five? Uh, so, uh, Sharon, I think you're asking a question, honestly, that I think uh, is one of the top questions that's coming up in the House of Commons, and I think just across the country. So thank you for asking that question. Uh, here's, here's um, I think what happens is, I think the government uh, had made a platform promise in 2019 that we would increase the old age security by 10% for everyone over 75, because I think it was felt that one, women live longer than men. We tend to have a lot of uh, more vulnerable women, uh, sort of 75 and over. Um, the costs are much higher as you get older to try to take, uh, you know, take care of yourself and your health needs. So I think that there was kind of like a stake in the ground of, uh, around 75 at that time. I think if we had said, to be honest, if we, have made, if we made it 70, we would have had people saying, why didn't you make it 65? If we made it 65, I think people would have said, well, why didn't you make it 60? So. I'll say to you, I think that we had to just make a decision. Uh, it was 75. Um, that's not to say that we don't need to do more, particularly with those with disabilities, Sharon. Um, and I will tell you, I did say this uh, during my presentation, I am disappointed uh, that we did not have more uh, for those uh, uh, that are struggling with disabilities, um, uh, not only within our community, but across Canada. We need to do more. There is like a big consultation coming up. We are putting more money around accessibility. Uh, and we're also hoping to redefine um, uh, uh, what type of credits or supports the federal government's actually going to be giving those within the disability credit uh, community, but it's just not now. So you'll have to just be part of, of that conversation. But I'll, look, yeah. Sharon, I, I know who you are, and I believe me, you will be part of all those discussions. Yeah. Um, I, I'm disappointed that we don't have any more in our budget, but uh, know that um, 
you know, you're definitely part of uh, top of mind for our Minister of, uh, of Employment, as well as our, our Deputy, uh, Deputy uh, Prime Minister and, and, and our whole uh, caucus. Disabled people die early. Mm -hmm. So if they die earlier, especially people like intellectual disabilities, how many are really going to be up at 70, live to 75 to get the money? Okay, I hear you. Um, I hear you. And like I said, I think we need to do more and I'm hoping to engage you as we sort of try to define what that more is. Yeah. I appreciate your, your uh, question. Okay, thanks Sharon, bye. Okay. Okay, um, I see Joe Pinto as next. <laughs> you have to unmute yourself. <laughs> well, oh, I just unmuted you. <laughs> Well, you unmuted me. Well, a minute ago, you were muted. I allow me, you so to now. speak, but I don't know. You have like, if you go on past like a minute and a half, Joe, I don't know. I'm going to have to press the mute button. Hey, listen, you know, uh, give me the hook. Give me the hook. Okay. Well, first of all, congratulations. This is really good to have this forum. Really proud of, uh, of you guys and really proud of you. I think it's a really, all in all, a really good budget. Normally, as you know, I'm, I'm pardon the expression, I, I, I go on about too much spending and craziness like that but these are unusual times and we're, this is an unusual budget and I think it's a good one I, I especially applaud you for the as you know I've been a long advocate of uh, greater benefits and better benefits for senior citizens and for our seniors and I applaud you on the old age security changes or uh, yeah the OAS and that's that's a really good thing uh, more more should be done however um, my question, I'm not, I also applaud you on the real estate, uh, foreign ownership, but I'm, I'm confused exactly what is the tax of, or is it a percentage? Is it a dollar amount? Where is it? I think the idea is a great one. I just, and something also should be done and needs to be done to curtail runaway real estate prices, particularly in Toronto. Younger people just simply can't get into it. And uh, this pandemic, if anything, instead of curtailing real estate prices, it actually uh, went the other way, which, which from an economic point of view is, doesn't seem to make any sense to me, but I'm not really sure. I like the idea of what we did with the foreign ownership and the tax and all that for non-residents for non -residents and, and non-used real estate, but I'm not sure exactly what the details are. Um, so I don't know if I can, um, I don't know if I know the exact details. Alex, do you happen to have more specific details in the budget? Yeah, I, I've pulled it out. It's a, a national annual 1% tax on the value of the, the real estate. If it's a, a non-resident, non-Canadian owned and considered vacant or underused. Okay. Can I make a suggestion? Make it 10. 10%? 10 sure. Why not? I mean, you know, I mean, it's, it's money laundering in any other form and that we shouldn't be the uh, the mules for that uh, and yes it is called muling and we shouldn't be for that and you know what um i think it could be really put to good use so the idea is great i think one percent just really scratches the surface thank you for your time no i think so much and, and thanks for pointing out some of the good things in our budget I thought for sure you were going to say that we we're spending way too much money. So I appreciate you. You uh... Unusual times. I reserve that right for later. But really, congratulations. Well done. Exactly. I just want to say a, a huge hello to a few people. Hi, Bonnie. Hi, Lena. I know Vera Frankel's on as well. I'm a big fan of hers. Um, I, I'm not able to read all of your comments, uh, Vera, but I know that uh, Jesse's probably, if there's a question, Jesse's going to ask it. Anyways, thanks, Joe. And I think we've got a question from Nick K. And I'll, I'll also, maybe you can do this at the same time, Julie, we have one about uh, pandemic readiness. Uh, if we ever end up in another pandemic, what are the next sort of steps we're taking in the chat as well? Okay, good question. So Nick, over to you. Hi. <laughs> uh, I, I, I mute to... myself and then someone mutes it and then I mute it and then they mute it. So anyways, I get it. Uh, thank you. I, I'm always very impressed with your uh, your um, presentations, you are on top of so many issues and uh, 700 plus page budget. Uh, maybe you've had a little advance uh, opportunity to look at it, but uh, it's very impressive. So thank you for this. I, I, my comment is that I, not having read it, I, and, and I didn't see it in your review, 
uh, there seems to be a, not much of a commitment to uh, renewables and incentivizing renewables, um, but I may be wrong about that. But that's not really where I want to go. A lot of the stuff in the budget, and, and this is typical of federal budgets, depend on provincial cooperation. I don't know if you want to address my question. I wouldn't blame you if you didn't want to. Uh, but my question is, like, what kind of cooperation can we expect on any of the progressive things in this budget, the, the things that people really need from this provincial government? And do you have a sense, does, does, the, government, does the federal government have a sense that they can work with Ontario to actually put these things into place? Mm -hmm. the, the child care, 50% funding uh, comes from the province. Uh, the transit, there's so many of the things that we really desperately need. And uh, I, anyway, I, you know, this, this government's refusal to address COVID by, by paid sick days, mm. which is one of the critical things to, to get this under control is just mind boggling to me. And so I figure they're gonna be objectionist or obstructionist in all respects. Mm -hmm. So if you don't want to talk about that, that's fine. Oh my gosh, Nick. No, I totally want to talk about it. And I appreciate you bringing it up. I would say this is one of the most unspoken about topics. And I would say to you, uh, it might not be the right time, like in terms of we're in the middle of a pandemic and we have to get out. And as a national government, and I think our prime minister is doing his best to say, we're going to save Canadians. We're going to be focused on save, saving Canadians. We're going to be focused on supporting Canadians and businesses as we come out of this. And we're focused on restarting our economy. And then let's start having some of these big conversations. So Nick, I am not afraid to shy away from it. I, I have, I actually, this is my personal belief. I actually think we have a broken model of funding and a broken model of how we work, not only between the provinces and the federal government, but also our municipalities. Our, like, if you talk to the arts and culture community, they're not, one of their number one things is that they're being pushed out of Toronto. It's getting too expensive. And so they're not able, like, you know, I think we've had 21 or 25 live music venues actually shut down during the pandemic. Who's going to save that space? Like, who's saving that space? I mean, the city might want to do it, but they don't have the power to do it. They are the child of the province uh, constitutionally. So there's no one that's actually actively trying to, uh, uh, you know, I, in my opinion, trying to address this issue. So it's a huge issue. And I would rather say it and put it on the table and us look at it. Now, I will say to you a few things. So the premier, as you see, like, I don't know if you've noticed that the national government's actually started directly giving funding to municipalities and to large groups <laughs> and bypassing the province. We've had to do that for transit. We go right now, the transit money could be taken away, by the way, but we do sort of try to go down to the municipalities as much as possible. Uh, we're trying to do, we're trying to bypass as much. When I say bypass, I, I have to be very uh, delicate. We do flow quite a bit of money still to our provinces, but in the cases where we need to expedite things or we need to urgently address things, we are deliberately sending dollars directly more and more to whether they're national organizations that are well accredited and well known and have, you know, the financial infrastructure in place to be able to sort of receive money from the federal level uh, and be able to audit properly, um, or we send it directly to municipalities. So know that we're doing more and more of that. If you saw our actions over the weekend, um, you know, people like me in downtown Toronto you know, who we're seeing, I, and I live, I live, our riding has four postal codes that are hotspots. We're not as bad as um, the Jane Finch area, and we're not as bad as uh, uh, North York, or even parts of Scarborough, but we are in the top four, for sure, <laughs> in terms of having hotspots and, uh, and needing to have been targeted in terms of uh, vaccines and in terms of strategy. So, um, in answer to your question, do I think that we can still put in pharmacare? Oh, by the way, for pharmacare, I mean, I would like the Minister of Health to validate this, but I'm fairly certain that uh, we have already started the conversations around uh, pharmacare with each of the provinces and territories, but I would, I know that some provinces are just not interested. And to your point, Nick, you know, I, I bet we would guess which ones those are. 
the best we can do right now, and I'm proud of what we've done. We've not only said we have a game plan, we're gonna put a framework around uh, childcare, we, we actually have like a full plan sort of, it's not sort of fully in our budget, but we put together a group to sort of put that together. We've costed it out. So that's the $30 billion over five years and then ongoing $8 billion a year. We have different models and scenarios of what the provinces and territories can sign on to. But you know what? It's about the best that we could do right now. Then the rest is going to be up to all of us to go to our governments and say, hey, you know, we want you to sort of adopt national, ch like the child care program and make that a priority. And so it, it will be part of us until we figure out, how, is there an opportunity for us to change the way we actually fund things and constitutionally are responsible things in this country, but it's a constitutional issue. But I will say to you, Nick, it can't be, the, the, it can't be that we don't wanna mention it or talk about it. We have to put it on the table and we have to start talking about it. What is, that, that was designed in, in the like mid 1800s, you know, and we were, you know, became a country in 1867. It fit maybe that, those times, but it doesn't fit the 21st century. And I do think we have to relook at it and I'm not scared to talk about it, but I thank you for the question. Lena, one of my other favorite people, thank you for all the amazing work you do. Oh my gosh. I just want to bow down every time. I. <laughs> well, Julie, thank you. Really, thank you for, and so many of you have said this already for the work you do in Davenport. Um, also, I just wanted to thank you for the work that was, or the dollars put into long-term care. As somebody who has a mom in a long-term care facility, I think that is so needed. So thank you so much that the budget did include that. Um, and Tony, uh, sorry, it was Nick. Nick, thank you for raising the issue of the provincial piece. <laughs> because Julie, you and I have talked about this. Um, you asked me what happened to the children's mental health dollars in the last budget. I don't know. The head of CMHO does not know. So um, we need to figure this out. Um, I still have a question though. I know that, um, and Alex and I were in the chat a little bit, over 216 um, million has been devoted over five years for averting youth away from the criminal justice system, which is great. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't find anything specific to children's mental health. Mm -hmm. There's lots on health, mental health, but I don't see anything specific to children's mental health? I don't see, I didn't see anything either. Although Alex is gonna do a quick search right now cause he's a uh, Speedy Gonzalez. Yeah. That's, it's like Alex Speedy Gonzalez keys. That's what we call him in the office. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but so Lena, I, I've been thinking about your, so for those that don't know, Lena runs an amazing organization called SNAP that um, helps with, um, I would say sort of best in class, sort of uh, mental health supports uh, for I would say youth, children, youth. Children children, and youth, it goes to youth. And to um, youth. Because one of the greatest, I think, we're all concerned about post the post pandemic. Yeah. But I can guarantee you, quote me 10 years from now, 15 years from now, yeah. I think one of the greatest detrimental impacts that we're gonna see from this pandemic is the mental health of our children and youth. Oh yes, for sure, for sure. And you know what, There, I know there is money around this because I know that we said, that we have to put it in. I don't know if it was just for medical health professionals. I actually think it was broader. I will say to you that there is funding, Lena, around gun violence. There's gonna be a lot of money about tackling the root causes of gun okay. violence. And a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, a lot of our youth and our children that are uh, yeah. in areas of poverty. And I think they, they actually are in many of the areas that you uh, are in. Uh, I have personally spoken about you behind the scenes, uh, behind the curtain of the federal government. And my understanding is that there is pockets of funding for exactly the work that you do. Uh, and that would be one of the areas and one of the pockets that you'd be able to, to, um, uh, to actually sort of apply to. Okay, and we'll, uh, we'll talk, absolutely. So thank you, thank you so much for all you guys have done. I really, really appreciate it, Julie. Okay, well, thank you. And thanks for all the work that you do. So I, I see that it's 820. And I just want to say, um, and uh, Jesse, I'll, uh, do we have any final questions just from the chat, just in case I miss anything or miss anyone? There's just one or two sort of clarifications about the differences between um, the luxury tax on on boats, etc, and uh, implementing a, a wealth tax, if you want to maybe just provide a little more clarification on that. 
Yeah, well, maybe I attributed something that I probably shouldn't have where I said, well, if you're doing a luxury tax, it's kind of like a partial wealth, wealth tax. Um, so I'm not quite sure whether that's true or not, because I think uh, it depends on how you define it. I was, I was researching wealth tax for those who are interested, and I found an NPR report, and they said wealth tax is like a property tax, and they were basically referring to the former presidential candidate Elizabeth Warren had, uh, had proposed a wealth tax. And so she said that it covered all forms of wealth, cash, stocks, diamonds, horses, super yachts, basically everything. And basically her proposal was to tax a person's net worth over $50 million. Uh, so a 2% annual tax. So I will say to you, um, I'm, I'm interested in any, anyone's literature. The reading I have is that um, a number of OECD countries, uh, I think 12 of them implemented a wealth tax in 1990 or they had a wealth tax in place in 1990 and that fell to four in 2017. And the little bit that I've read, and this is from the OECD, I have another report in front of me, that talks about how the, the revenue that has come in um, has not necessarily, uh, well, has not resulted in, in increased revenue. And two, unfortunately, there is a flight of capital and a flight of money and citizenship to go from one jurisdiction to the next, depending on who actually puts, uh, puts in a wealth tax. That's not to say that we shouldn't be entertaining this moving forward. So I look forward to anyone who can give me some literature that says, here's why we think it would be successful for Canada. Um, I think I'm always open to, uh, uh, you know, to, to, to looking at this and to, to, uh, to studying it, whether it's, it's a good option to promote. Um, but I think that that is what I've been able to find so far. So maybe I shouldn't have uh, correlated the luxury tax on you know, expensive vehicles and um, aircraft, uh, aircrafts, and uh, and sort of like personal sort of boats. Uh, but uh, so I'll just sort of like disassociate those, and just say for those that are interested in me pursuing a tax, I would love to just get some literature of how it's successful in the four countries or in any of the countries that might actually sort of still have them in place. So, anyways, I think I need to wrap up at say twenty, and my team, who's amazing, hasn't had dinner yet. Uh, and I just want to uh, first just give a huge shout out uh, to my team, Paul De Freitas, who's uh, instrumental in all the uh, amazing thinking that comes out of my <laughs> out of my office, uh, to Monica, uh, to um, uh, to Alex, uh, to Jesse, uh, and uh, just they're extraordinary people who uh, every day come to work. We still answer phones. We get back to people. It's not always as timely as we like it, and sometimes we drop a call or an email here and there but we do our best to try to respond to people because I know in a world of uh, increased digitization, everybody gets a, you know, they get a menu. You have nine options and then you have three options and then you have two options and you might eventually get someone half an hour later. But anyways, I wanna say a huge thanks to them. It's because of them that I could serve the community so well. And I just wanna say thanks to all of you for your excellent questions and for participating. Um, and thanks for all that you do to create a great uh, community. So please stay safe. Stay in touch, and hopefully we'll uh, we'll see you sometime this summer. And please get vaccinated. <laughs> Take care. Bye.